angels waging war in the unseen realm. Global events fulfilling biblical prophecy. Eternal life. What lies beyond mortality? From analyzing the paranormal from a biblical worldview to the discussion of cutting edge science and technology, conspiracy, discovery, special investigative reports. Unafraid to explore the challenging issues facing humanity. Welcome to another edition of Skywatch TV. Demon possession is a real phenomenon, but that's not something we often hear from credentialed scholars, especially not credentialed scholars from mainline Protestant denominations. Welcome to Skywatch TV. I'm Derek Gilbert in studio with my wife and best friend, Sharon K. Gilbert, and our <laughs> guest, who is especially interesting because he's written two books on this topic from a scholar's perspective. The first, I Am Not Afraid, Demon Possession and Spiritual Warfare, and his new book, Afraid, Demon Possession and Spiritual Warfare in America. It's our honor to welcome to the program the Reverend Dr. Robert Bennett. Robert, well, thank welcome. you very much. It's wonderful to be here with, with you finally. I've followed you for so long over the uh, podcast, and it's good to be here with both of you. <laughs> and you still came here, didn't I you? I did. <laughs> I did. I've been looking forward to it. Uh, the books that you've written uh, get into, especially the first book, is really a scholarly look. The new book is, is more of an introductory level. Would that be a fair way to Yeah, I think that's it? a good way to look at it. The, the, the first book comes out of the dissertation, uh, re rewriting of my, my PhD dissertation, whereas the second book kind of gets into the, the nuts and the bolts of, okay, how does this look in the United States? What are real problems that people are dealing with? And, and and what are the answers for these problems? Okay, well, you, you, again, the first book came out of your, your doctoral dissertation. Uh, you currently serve as professor of missiology and international missions, missions specialist at Concordia Theological Seminary That's in correct. Fort Wayne. Um, why this topic for your dissertation? I completely fell into it. It was not planned in any way. Uh, I decided to work on the PhD in missiology as uh, a number of uh, other professors encouraged me to do so. I needed something to study. And it just so happens I had good friends in Madagascar who asked me there to come and dedicate a building we were providing for, the, for an orphanage. And when I got there, I noticed that that particular church body has a very large growth. There are about five million members of, of the Lutheran Church in Madagascar. Wow. And about half of the country itself is still animistic, so they're still uh, living with the traditional religions, uh, worshiping, venerating their ancestors and other spirits. And it turns out, I said, well, I'm going to study conversion. What, what's taking place? How are these people becoming Christians? And when I started actually doing the research and the study, it turns out that exorcism was a very big part of the conversion of these people who are coming out of this animistic uh, religion and becoming Christians. And the reason for that is in those animistic religions, they don't believe in demons necessarily. They think they're talking to, their, to the long lost ancestors or kingly figures. And so they're actually seeking to be possessed by these, by these um, spiritual entities because they think if I'm possessed, I'll have the ability to, to uh, read fortunes or uh, know what herbs to use for healing. And so they're actively trying to be possessed. And so when they interact with the gospel, there's a, a large clash that takes place there. Hmm. And that's how I kind of ran into the subject and I said, that's a good idea for a book. Didn't that surprise you? Because surely the Lutheran uh, uh, seminary doesn't have a massive section where you study uh, uh, spiritual uh, uh, exorcism and, and you know, actually looking at real spiritual warfare. Yeah, or exactly. Do they? No, I, they don't. Because I'm not. I did, wasn't raised Lutheran, sure. so I really don't know. No, they they don't at all. And uh, most uh, men that I went through the seminary with, we would ask our professors uh, about these topics. Uh, not that we wanted an in-depth understanding, but but just uh, they're part of the Bible. And so, what do we do? We run into these various circumstances, and really, the, we we could not get an answer. Um, there was not an answer to be had. There was not a particular book that anybody could say, you know, this book here, 
start here, move on to this next one. Although we have lots of resources that were spread over, over books over the last 500 years, mm -hmm. it was little pieces and little books. And so that's, when I started studying this, I thought, well, it's about time somebody writes a book and, and has it available for men who are studying in our seminary, and then um, made a little bit of change to it to make it more open to every, everyone who's wow. interested in the topic. Now, too. what was your view of the phenomenon, demon possession and the right of exorcism, when you first went to Madagascar and was there something that occurred while you were there that changed your worldview? Sure, I, I always believed in the re reality of these things, the possibility of, of these things, but I'd, I'd never encountered anything. Um, and I, I grew up as a part of, of this American Western culture, a very scientific mm -hmm. uh, thought pattern, um, you know, more of the enlightenment uh, way of viewing things. And so I, I accepted the reality of this because it was biblical but I just had no interaction with it. Uh, and and every, every time I've asked anybody about it uh, in my circles, they didn't have any interaction with it either. Um, so when I was in Madagascar doing their research, uh, happened to uh, go to one of their mass events. They have these events there in the summer to basically the Christians who, who now become Christians in the summer months is when they have their major pagan festivals. And there's a real draw on the Christians to interact with these pagan festivals because they're family who are attached to it. So the church puts on these alternate events during the, the summer for the, for the Christians. And usually there's 10, 12,000 people at these, these particular events. And in Madagascar, they have this interesting way of, of, of looking at the spiritual world. They're, they understand this is real, it's around them. Uh, and so they do a, a mass exorcism of place. Um, now, we've always had these type of uh, rituals in, the, in our church bodies here in the U.S. We used to call them dedication of a building or a house blessing or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, but they would do this, this max ex exorcism of the location. And if anything was found there, if there were any demon-possessed people, then they would move to a specific uh, exorcism of the individuals. Well, most of the time, there's not because it's just Christians who are gathered there. At this particular event, however, uh, because it was so large, some of the uh, people from the villages started to come and sit along the sides and watch the event. Oh. But these were the people who were interacting with the spirits in the traditional religions. And so when they started their, their mass exorcism of the location, just basically trying to purify the area before they started their services, uh, one particular lady who happened to be sitting at my feet, uh, is talking about divine providence a bit, um, <laughs> Uh, started to scream and wail when they started to say, be gone in the name of Jesus. And, and I just I had this little camera that had a video function back in the old day before we had all the technology that we have now. And I, I started to videotape this exorcism of this individual. And, 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 I, and I have it available. It's on YouTube and people can find it in places like that. So that's the first time I saw something like this. And at first I thought, well, this must be fake. You know, because obviously I'm here from, from a different country and I'm studying things, so they probably set me up. Let's put one over on the right. American. Yeah. But the problem was, is originally where they told me to stand, I couldn't get a good view with my camera. And so I chose the location, and the person who ended up having the, the, the demon in them was already sitting there, when I, so, the, so they couldn't set oh. me up on this thing. But that just kind of shows how, how the scientific side of my mind is working. I'm thinking, well, this can't be real, so there, there, must, be a, there must be an explanation for it. Well, you know, five minutes in, I'm starting to recognize, well, wait a minute, this is, there's something going on here. And the really odd thing was, it was not out of the ordinary for the people who were there. Uh, you know, huh. if we seen something like this going on, we'd probably react pretty, pretty strongly to it. But everyone just kind of accepted, okay, we know what this is, we've seen it over and over again. And so they have these teams of, of exorcists that, that, that come over and all of them together are simply saying, be gone in the name of Jesus Christ. And it's a, it's a quite impelling uh, uh, a video to watch, but that was my first experience with it. But, but I, what I thought was interesting about it after the fact is it wasn't real ritualistic. Uh, it was simply, um, uh, they were simply saying, be gone in the name of Jesus. And they were singing some hymns. And, um, and before that, when they did the general exorcism, they were uh, reading some scripture and, and giving short mm -hmm. sermons. So, but nothing uh, as you'd see in Hollywood with some of the Roman Catholic rituals and things like that. Was your doctoral advisor a little surprised when you decided to write on that? Yeah, I think everyone was surprised when I, when I started to write on that. Even the publisher on the uh, first book when it came out warned me that I probably wasn't going to get a very 
good uh, reception, and it turned out to be just the opposite. Hmm. Um, I've got actually a very good reception from from people that maybe I thought would have given me a, a difficult time. Hmm. Uh, but I try to write very systematically and, and anticipate what questions someone might have. And actually, some of the book reviews on it have, have actually uh, kind of condemned me in that sense that, that I was always explaining and, and kind of you know, as if I didn't believe, just, but I was doing so f- for, for people maybe who didn't believe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and should point out that the uh, publisher, Concordia, is uh, a, I- I- am I correct, it's an arm of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod? It is, it's the official publisher of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, and, and what that means in my circles is anything that is published has to actually go through a doctrinal review. Mm-hmm. So these are the only two books currently in our particular church body that are actually officially doctrinally approved uh, by our synod for use in our church. And again, I just think that's remarkable. And again, coming from a, yeah. a, a scientistic culture where we have been soaking in this, this positivist worldview, this idea that science has all the answers. Uh, you said Americans seeing what you saw there in Madagascar would react strongly uh, I think you're right, but I think our reaction would be to call 911 and get the EMTs oh, out there. Oh, sure. Get medical yeah, we, we, we definitely wouldn't have done what they were doing. We wouldn't have <laughs> called a team of exorcists right. in. The, so your first book is ver- a very scholarly approach, and where you examine the uh, the stories, the accounts in Madagascar, uh, and then back it up with a, a systematic look at the theology, uh, predominantly Lutheran theologians, but you know tying that into the Bible. Where do they draw the biblical support for the beliefs that these theologians, the great theologians of the past, have uh, what confirmed their belief that this is actually a real phenomenon? But again, coming from a uh, this American, this Western scientistic worldview. Uh, how did this reshape your view of the spirit realm, uh, seeing that event and then talking to the church there and realizing for these people this is just another day? It was quite a, um, quite a transition at first because I had to really kind of re- rethink of, of how I viewed the world around me. Uh, but that's what's interesting is when you, when you start to, to be a little bit more open to these things, you start to run into them all over the place, and, and hence the second book, where I talk about you know the things that are in our, that are in our lives all the time that sometimes we don't even recognize. But it's interesting going back to the point of that first book. I actually, because of the uh, the difficulty that I expected to encounter, I divided the book up into two different sections. The first section deals specifically with Madagascar, the stories of the people's lives before they were Christian, when they were converting into Christianity, the Christian, their life now. But I did that purposely for the American reader or for the Western reader, because it's really easy to say, okay, well, I trust this account here but I don't know if I believe it in my own context. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's why the second part of the book then goes and says, okay, well, um, all the Gospels, how did the Gospels deal with this topic? And then, from my own tradition, how did the various um, scholars in our tradition, going all the way back to Martin Luther, deal with this topic? And it becomes very obvious that this is something that's always been a part of our theology, but really has been lost since about the 1920s. Yeah, yeah. There, we, there's a line in the movie, The Exorcist, I make reference to this mm-hmm. every now and then because it seems to summarize this, where one of the characters, Father Karras, who is the assistant right. to the exorcist in the, in the film, tells the mother of the possessed girl that the church quit believing in demon possession and exorcism when it discovered the science of psychology. Right. Mm-hmm. And it seems to, that summarizes kind well, of the and, Western and world. And there's view. a line from another movie we like where the, the main character says the greatest, the greatest trick, trick the devil ever pulled sure. was convincing the world he doesn't exist. Exactly right. And that's why I'm glad you wrote the second book because it's really easy to read the first book and think, oh, that's over there. That will never happen here. That's not going to happen in my backyard. This is the United States of America. We're civilized. We don't have demons here. Well, what I found is when I wrote the first book, uh, people started talking about it. And all of a sudden, people were going to their pastors with problems that their pastor had no idea existed for the last 10, 20. In in the book here, I have a story that for 40 years, uh, people were dealing with uh, difficult spirits in their homes, talked to their pastor about it, and their pastor said, well, I don't know what to do, and and continued to live with it until they actually went to find someone helpful advice, and I got involved with it. But uh, all the second book comes out of that. Um, All of a sudden, as pastors start talking about these things, and actually as if they believe them, they start preaching the gospel text like these are realities, all of a sudden the people who've been dealing with problems for all this time will start to talk to their pastors. Before that, they would just say, well, my pastor won't believe me, he'll think I'm crazy, or whatever the case is. So it's, I, I get phone calls from, 
from pastors of my own denomination, you know, probably every, at least every couple of weeks saying, what do I do with this? Mm -hmm. You uh, explain three different worldviews that you say are sort of the predominant worldviews uh, as regards our understanding of the spirit realm, the uh, naturalistic or animistic worldview, the biblical worldview, and then a postmodern worldview. Mm -hmm. Can you summarize those for us and kind of identify where we in America are? Oh, uh, sure. Well, the scientific worldview we, we know quite well, the naturalistic worldview, it, it generally looks at the world as a closed system. So, so miracles, uh, spiritual type things would be outside of the system. Um, although we're starting to see in that naturalistic worldview, these other views come in now uh, related to, oh, how did we get here? So it must have been an ancient alien, for instance, or, right. or something like that. So people are trying to explain their way, trying to avoid the spiritual side of things by explaining it in different ways. So the naturalistic worldview would just be the scientific worldview where everything needs to be quantified, there's an answer for everything, it's a closed system that's out there. Um, the, the biblical worldview would be simply that. Uh, it would be the, the narrative that you would find in the scriptures, that these are realities, um, that, that death is related to sin, um, that sickness is, is related to sin, um, that there's a, a host of spiritual realities out there, that there is the powers and the principalities. Um, so it's just simply that, a, a biblical worldview. The, the postmodern worldview is, is really turning into more of a spiritualistic worldview, although it can be a, a, on, on, any, on any of the spectrums. And really what that is, is truth itself is question uh, as, as an objective reality. Hmm. Whereas truth becomes that which I decide to be true for myself. And, and you see many people now, they're starting to incorporate various aspects of spirituality, whether it be parts of Christianity or, or Hinduism or, or, or Islam or, or whatever the case, Buddhism, and, and kind of mix it all together into one tapestry of what their belief is uh, as, as kind of this new entity of belief. Cafeteria line yeah. spirituality, right. take a little yeah. of this, a little of that, a little right. of this. Yeah. Uh, you call in the book uh, American spirituality a lost worldview. What do you mean by that? Uh, the lost worldview, I would think, would be an understanding that uh, because of all of this mixture uh, of various uh, religious and spiritual ideas, uh, there really is no real view anymore. Uh, there is no co cohesive view of, of the world. Um, I could talk to one neighbor and, and they would have a completely different view of the world than my next neighbor, than my next neighbor. And so there is no objectiveness anymore. It's just this lostness amongst the community. Is, is this uh, something that you find in the church as well? I mean, have we lost, uh, have we, we cut the cables that once tied us to the, the creeds the, uh, of the past? Yeah, and actually that's something I talk about in the second book, Afraid. Is, is what's been going on in our own culture. The, the churches seem to be going out of their way to adapt themselves to the culture with, with the good intention to, to reach people in that culture. So, so how do we reach the people in that culture? We'll adapt ourselves and try to go in. But at the same time, they're, they're losing the distinctive nature of, of the Christian faith, and they're also foregoing many of the things that have sustained the church uh, through the hymnody, um, uh, through various older types of liturgy, which the, the good ones are simply Bible verses mm -hmm. that, are, that are responded. So I think churches are losing these things, trying to adapt to the culture, and at that point they're no longer speaking a true Christian message and is all of its clarity to the culture. So we see the more and more the church tries to adapt itself to the culture, the more we see the decline of the church in the Western world. Mm. The Malagasy people, Madagascar, uh, in their approach to the oppression and possession by demons of people around them. Um, how do they respond? Is this a, an official church function or are there are lay people, do they train lay people to go out and... and well, they do. They, they, they have uh, something they would call piandri. It's uh, lay people and pastors together. Um, they have a very distinct understanding of the office of the ministry in that particular church body. It's only pastors uh, do the actual work in the church service, but they have these trained lay people that they call piandri that are trained in, um, in biblical understanding, they're trained in exorcism, they're trained in evangelism, Evangelism, who work with the pastors, and that's one of the reasons the church grows. They're also trained in, in mercy work or caring for individuals. And so they're out actively working in the communities all the time, and uh, one of the part of that would be exorcism. So the pastor might take the main role, uh, and the others would, would assist them, but sometimes the pastor might not be there, and they'll, they'll do it themselves too. So you've got people who are just regular members of the parish who are 
uh, working side by side with with the trained pastors to go out and engage in spiritual warfare on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, and the thing is about it too, it's, it's, it's not a strange thing to them. It's, it would be just like anything else that you would do as a part of an aspect of your ministry. Mm-hmm. And that's what I found in, in our own history. Um, you know, we lost this in, in our particular church body for a number of years, or at least technically did. But in the older days, uh, the, the beginning of our, of our um, church, pastors would be actually taught in seminary. Uh, your job is to uh, you know, visit the sick, visit those who are in prison, uh, those who are dealing with various spiritual ailments, el- uh, and those who are demon-possessed. Uh, just as one category amongst many categories, mm-hmm. not made in any special light or anything like that. And that's what we've lost in the last, you know, 70, 80 years. In the stories that you've collected for the second book and to a certain degree for the first book, but primarily here in the United States, did you find that there are certain areas that tend to be hot spots? No, I, I didn't. I think it's, it's especially w- with the way our, our, our world is set up these days with the internet and with travel, um, it isn't like hot spots anymore. These, most of these stories come out of the Midwest, uh, places that? that you would never expect. You know, one story in the first chapter of the second book is a, a woman in Michigan who um, is trying to figure out what's wrong with her life. She's not being productive as she thinks she should be as a Christian. And so she actually, uh, she doesn't realize this, but she, she finds a voodoo priest, a little Haiti in Miami, and flies him up all the way to Michigan to do the various rituals in her house so she could get you know, the spirit of blessing. And it really turns out bad for her. And, and the whole story talks about how that's taken care of in the book. Was she, she Haitian by? She was not. She was, I mean, she didn't realize that, that he was a voodoo priest. She just heard there was this spiritual leader. Found him on the uh, internet. Yeah, other people talking probably in some chat rooms or something, that there was a spiritual leader that could help people. And, and she paid for him and flew him up. And they did some very strange rituals in her home. And it's, the whole story's in there. But oh my, I, I remember uh, writing this chapter and my wife, uh, who generally serves as a, as a second reader for me on things, she's reading the chapter. She goes, is this real? I was, yeah, it's actually a real story. But it, it almost comes off like it's something you would see you know, in the movies or something. Oh my. There was a case not long ago from Gary, Indiana, of a woman whose uh, home yeah, sure. was, uh, w- w- well, I- in a sense, similar to the, a story that you record in, in the book Afraid. I mean, her children were, were uh, being... Uh, abused basically mm-hmm. and there was a case in front of a uh, social worker where one of the children uh, according to the social worker walked backwards up the wall and halfway across the ceiling before dropping down to the floor um, also police witnessed things that they couldn't explain naturally a- and yet she wasn't as I understand the story trying to read between the lines the news accounts that she was having difficulty finding a pastor who understood what was happening and be willing to help because she was doing things like uh, you know, lighting candles and, and uh, you know, waving the smoke of sage right. through different mm-hmm. rooms and things like that. How difficult, based on the contact that you've had and the stories that you researched, how difficult is it for people in America to find pastors who are prepared to deal with this problem? Good question. I, I think it's, a, it's, it's quite a difficult problem. Uh, and, it, it, and sometimes pastors just simply don't want anything to do with it. They're, they're fearful or, or they don't believe it. There's, there's a number of pastors that simply just don't believe these things. Um, but, but I would think the, the uh, pastors who, who care about their people would want to help. It's just in, in most cases, they've not had any type of training or instruction on what to do. And that was my, my hope of the second book here is uh, while it's written for, for lay people indeed, um, that pastors could say, okay, well, how would I handle this particular situation? Mm-hmm. And that's why there's so many case studies in there of step by step how the issues are dealt with. So does this go back to the seminaries? They're just failing to address the spiritual aspect? They are. Um, and there, it's interesting, in the, in the first book, uh, I quote uh, author uh, H- uh, Helmut uh, Thielich, uh, who gives three reasons. Let's see if I can remember them from, from memory, but if I remember properly, the one is uh, these things just aren't simply acceptable in academic speak. If you're an academic and you start speaking about these things, well then obviously uh, you're, you're not a true academic. And so uh, and in any institution, uh, no matter where you find yourself, uh, those who teach, those who are professors, they want to appear to be 
academics, so it's difficult. It's really no different than it would be you know, in, a, in a general workplace. Um, you know, to tell somebody about your faith is sometimes kind of scary because mm -hmm. how are they going to look at you? Then look at you different now. So that's one of the reasons that that he, he keep mentioned. The other reason was that these things simply are not scientifically quantifiable. You, you you can't take these spiritual things, and as much as some of the uh, the paranormal groups are out there trying to do this, you, you can't take these spiritual things and put them in the scientific categories. But if you can observe a phenomenon, that is, I mean, you have to find a way to explain it. Right, but... If a kid walks up a wall and on the ceiling, you got to explain that. You do, way. you do. <laughs> um, but that's why people are staying away from it. Uh, and, and the third one is, is very unpolitically correct, but, but, I, but I think he's right. Uh, the example he uses is, uh, you know... Stupidity does not understand the stupid, just as evil doesn't understand evil. Um, you know, if, if you speak to an evil person, they probably don't ex view themselves as evil. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so some people just simply are unable to, to understand that. Well, Paul, uh, for instance, in, um, in Ephesians chapter 2, he, he speaks about how everyone is born in this world. He uses the Greek word nekros, dead. But he, he talks about them being walking around dead people. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're all born spiritually dead, and it takes that miracle uh, of God through his word to actually bring faith and to, to allow us to understand these spiritual things. And I think that's Tilke's the third point there is, you know, you know, evil doesn't understand itself to be evil. Dead things don't understand themselves to be dead. Yeah. Hmm. 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 We'd like to make these books available to you because these are excellent reference resources for you and also to share with friends, perhaps even share with your pastor. Uh, Dr. Robert Bennett's two books, the first book, Afraid, Demon Possession and Spiritual Warfare, and the second book, or rather, I Am Not Afraid, the second book is Afraid, Demon Possession and Spiritual Warfare in America. These two books for $39.99 plus shipping and handling, but when you buy those two books, we will add a book that actually cites Dr. Bennett's first book as part of the uh, source material, and that is Chris Putnam's excellent book, Supernatural Worldview. All three of those books for you for $39.99 from Skywatch TV. You'll find the deal online at skywatchtvstore.com. In our next conversation, Dr. Bennett, I want to talk about uh, how certain elements of uh, certain practices that we sort of take for granted in church services uh, actually have an exorcistic function, uh, okay. and that we, as Christians, uh, should be essentially performing exorcisms almost every single day without even realizing it. Dr. Robert Bennett, the author of I Am Not Afraid and Afraid, and we'll continue this conversation next week here on Skywatch TV. We thank you for watching as we keep watch. For Sharon Gilbert, I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is Skywatch TV. The supernatural realm is real, and we humans are naturally curious about it. That's why there are so many television reality shows featuring ghost hunters and alien chasers and mediums and psychics. Now, by and large, the Christian church avoids these controversial topics, even though we have the authoritative book on the subject. That's our mission at Skywatch TV, is to address issues of the paranormal and the supernatural from a Christian, a biblical perspective. But we depend on your support to do it. To find out how you can support Skywatch TV prayerfully and financially, please log on to our website, skywatchtv.com. And keep watching as we keep watch at Skywatch TV. Uh, the books that you've written uh, get into, especially the first book, is really a scholarly look. The new book is is more of an introductory level. Would that be a fair way to yeah, describe it? Yeah, I think that's it? a good way to look at it. The, the, the first book comes out of the dissertation, uh, re rewriting of my, my PhD dissertation, whereas the second book kind of gets into the, the nuts and the bolts of, okay, how does this look in the United States? What are real problems that people are dealing with, and, and what are the answers for these problems? Okay, well, you, you, again, the first book came out of your, your doctoral dissertation. Uh, you you currently serve as professor of missiology and international missions, missions specialist at Concordia Theological Seminary That's in correct. Fort Wayne. Um, why this topic for your dissertation? I completely fell into it. It was not planned in any way. I decided to work on the PhD in missiology as 
A number of uh, other professors encouraged me to do so. I needed something to study. And it just so happens I had good friends in Madagascar who asked me there to come and dedicate a building we were providing for, the, for an orphanage. And when I got there, I noticed that that particular church body has a very large growth. There are about five million members of, of the Lutheran Church in Madagascar. Wow. And about half of the country itself is still animistic. So they're still uh, living with the traditional religions, uh, worshiping, venerating their ancestors and other spirits. And it turns out, I said, well, I'm going to study conversion. What, what's taking place? How are these people becoming Christians? And when I started actually doing the research and the study, it turns out that exorcism was a very big part of the conversion of these people who are coming out of this. Angels waging war in the unseen realm. Global events fulfilling biblical prophecy. Eternal life. What lies beyond mortality? From analyzing the paranormal from a biblical worldview to the discussion of cutting edge science and technology, conspiracy, discovery, special investigative reports, unafraid to explore the challenging issues facing humanity. Welcome to another edition of Skywatch TV. Demon possession is a real phenomenon, but that's not something we often hear from credentialed scholars, especially not credentialed scholars from mainline Protestant denominations. Welcome to Skywatch TV. I'm Derek Gilbert in studio with my wife and best friend, Sharon K. Gilbert, and our guest, who is especially interesting because he's written two books on this topic from a scholar's perspective. The first, I Am Not Afraid, Demon Possession and Spiritual Warfare, and his new book, Afraid, Demon Possession and Spiritual Warfare in America. It's our honor to welcome to the program the Reverend Dr. Robert Bennett. Robert, well, thank welcome. you very much. It's wonderful to be here with, with you finally. I've followed you for so long over the uh, podcast, and it's good to be here with both of you. <laughs> and you still came here, didn't I you? I did. <laughs> I did. I've been looking forward to it. This exorcism of place. Um, now, we've always had these type of uh, rituals in, the, in our church bodies here in the U.S. We used to call them dedication of a building or a house blessing or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, but they would do this, this max ex exorcism of the location. And if anything was found there, if there were any demon-possessed people, then they would move to a specific uh, exorcism of the individuals. Well, most of the time, there's not, because it's just Christians who are gathered there. At this particular event, however, uh, because it was so large, some of the uh, people from the villages started to come and sit along the sides and watch the event. Oh. But these were the people who were interacting with the spirits and the traditional religions. And so when they started their, their mass exorcism of the location, just basically trying to purify the area before they started their services, uh, one particular lady who happened to be sitting at my feet, uh, talk about divine providence a bit, um, <laughs> Uh, started to scream and wail when they started to say, be gone in the name of Jesus. And, and I just I had this little camera that had a video function back in the old day before we had all the technology that we have now. And I, I started to videotape this exorcism of this individual. And, 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 I, and I have it available. It's on YouTube and people can find it in places like that. So that's the first time I saw something like this. And at first I thought, well, this must be fake. You know, because obviously I'm here from, from a different country and I'm studying things. So they probably set me up. Let's put one over on the right. American. Yeah. But the problem was is originally where they told me to stand I couldn't get a good view with my camera and so I chose the location and the person who started studying this I thought well it's about time somebody writes a book and and has it available for men who are studying in our seminary and then um, made a little bit of change to it to make it more open to every everyone who's interested in the topic. Now too. what was your view of the phenomenon demon possession and the right of exorcism when you first went to Madagascar and was there something that occurred while you were there that changed your worldview? Sure, I, I always believed in the re reality of these things, the possibility of, of these things, but I'd, I'd never encountered anything. Um, and I, I grew up as a part of, of this American Western culture, a very scientific mm -hmm. uh, thought pattern, um, you know, more of the enlightenment uh, way of viewing things. And so I, I accepted the reality of this because it was biblical. 
but I just had no interaction with it. Uh, and every, every time I've asked anybody about it uh, in my circles, they didn't have any interaction with it either. Um, so when I was in Madagascar doing their research, uh, happened to uh, go to one of their mass events. They have these events there in the summer to basically the Christians who, who now become Christians in the summer months is when they have their major pagan festivals. And there's a real draw on the Christians to interact with these pagan festivals because they're family who are attached to it. So the church puts on these alternate events during the, the summer for the, for the Christians. And usually there's 10, 12,000 people at these, these particular events. And in Madagascar, they have this interesting way of, of, of looking at the spiritual world. They're, they understand this is real, it's around them. Uh, and so they do a, a mass animistic uh, religion in becoming Christians. And the reason for that is in those animistic religions, they don't believe in demons necessarily. They think they're talking to their to the long lost ancestors or kingly figures. And so they're actually seeking to be possessed by these by these um, spiritual entities because they think if I'm possessed, I'll have the ability to, to uh, read fortunes or uh, know what herbs to use for healing. And so they're actively trying to be possessed. And so when they interact with the gospel, there's a, a large large clash that takes place there. Hmm. And that's how I kind of ran into the subject and I said, that's a good idea for a book. Didn't that surprise you? Because surely the Lutheran uh, uh, seminary doesn't have a massive section where you study uh, uh, spiritual uh, uh, exorcism and, and you know, actually looking at real spiritual warfare. Yeah, or exactly. Do they? No, I, they don't. They don't I'm not at all. A, I wasn't raised Lutheran, sure. so I really don't know. No, they, they don't at all. And uh, most uh, men that I went through the seminary with, we would ask our professors uh, about these topics. Uh, not that we wanted an in-depth understanding, but, but just uh, they're part of the Bible. And so what do we do? We run into these various circumstances. And really, the, we, we could not get an answer. Um, there was not an answer to be had. There was not a particular book that anybody could say, you know, this book here, start here, move on to this next one. Although we have lots of resources that were spread over, over books over the last 500 years, mm -hmm. it was little pieces and little books. And so that's when I